We're back with another episode of Right Here in Mass. Joining us today is Kevin Rothschild Shea, the founder of Architecture Environment Life Incorporated, which he started in 2008 after working for a local firm specializing in housing projects for 18 years. Kevin is currently licensed in Massachusetts and Connecticut and holds memberships with the National Council of Architectural Registration Board in the American Institute of Architects, also known as AIA. Kevin, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you today. Likewise. Please share with our audience more about you and what you do. Sure. So we are a, a Western Mass uh, based firm. Uh, we're in Asa Meadow, just a couple miles outside of Springfield. Uh, we are a firm of about uh, seven, currently seven people. Historically, we run around seven to nine. Uh, yeah, we're a firm that uh, essentially evolved from a kind of a jack of all trades firm in Western Mass. You do a little bit of everything, um, but we have uh, developed or evolved into a specialty uh, for offering the multifamily uh, residential housing. Uh, that's really evolved into the core of our work. Uh, with the affordable housing really being the center of the multifamily. We do have some market rate residential and we do enjoy a few uh, custom residential uh, projects here and there as well. Mm. Um, but we, uh, you know, being the, the jack of all trades, we'll say we do commercial, medical, uh, retail, industrial, a little bit of municipal work, uh, a little bit of historic. So we, um, we kind of touch on a lot of different projects. And what made you want to focus on or specialize in the multifamily specifically? Uh, I think it kind of evolved over time. Uh, in my first leg of my career, I worked at a small firm also in Western Mass uh, that did a lot of uh, multifamily, uh, a lot of HUD housing projects uh, back in the day when, uh, you know, back in the day when there were lots of HUD, a lot of elderly projects out on the books since they, they started that firm with a focus in the 70s and that that just kept running right up into the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, so when I went out on my own, we had some of those uh, uh, connections in place uh, and gradually over time, they just um, kind of gained traction and took hold, especially as uh, the natural evolution of things. Some of the original firms in Western Mass retired or closed up shop. Uh, we ended up uh, being in a great position of being the experienced firm, having having the connections and uh, having built up the business kind of ready to step into that niche. So it's mm. one of those things that kind of is a ways working out, but one thing leads to the next. Um, and uh, here we are. And with being uh, licensed in both Massachusetts and Connecticut, would you say that most of your work goes over towards the Western part of the state or do you kind of travel all throughout Massachusetts and different parts of Connecticut? It, I would say our trade is pretty regional um mm -hmm. the we do see you know we do see firms from east especially worcester or boston uh coming out this way on occasion although the uh the market is a little different in western mass versus the boston metro area especially as it relates to price point <laughs> um but for us we're so close to connecticut it's just a few miles south to the uh, connecticut line mm -hmm. um that the Hartford, Western Connecticut area is very similar to the market in Western Mass, the Springfield area. Um, so those two kind of fit uh, together nicely. Uh, most of our work is in Western Mass, probably within 25 miles of the office here. Uh, we do have a, uh, a client, the Community Builders, uh, who has, we're working on two projects in Worcester with, um, and those are both uh, affordable housing. One is an SRO. Uh, the other is a uh, family uh, housing project, which we're developing for funding. So those are within the within the reach uh, without spending too much time traveling. Uh, I think both sites are within 45 minutes of the office and those make it pretty manageable. But uh, mm -hmm. generally speaking, we service the projects through the life of construction. So you want to be reasonably close to the project. Um, we don't want to be in the car all day, all week, and clients don't really want to be paying for travel time, so. Right, and for the residential projects that you work on specifically, would you say that it's the developers and builders who hire you, or do homeowners themselves ever hire you directly? How does that typically look? 
Uh, I guess it's all of the above. The smaller mm. custom single family, uh, those are the homeowners and the ind individuals hiring us. Uh, usually those people that are hiring us have a very specific project with very specific design goals that uh, the average homeowner and contractor can't solve or produce themselves. So they um, basically elevate to uh, a design firm like ourselves to help them uh, develop the vision and put the lines on paper and help them get it built. Um, a lot of our multifamily projects, those are handled by professional developers. They're big projects. They take many years to develop, uh, lots of funding uh, requirements, whether it's privately financed or through the state. So those, those can be years in the making and you gotta have some pretty significant uh, wherewithal to manage and develop and finance those projects. So we're mm -hmm. bidding one now that has a 2018 project date and we're just going to bid now. That's what we started wow. over four years ago. So they take years to develop, years to get permitted, to get funded, eventually, hopefully to get a, a shovel in the ground. So, mm. uh, and I had, that's similar to, we work with private developers that may develop for profit uh, versus the developers that are working in the affordable housing market. They really, the, their goal is to, is more mission-based. They're looking to serve the need and develop to fit the need and work for a cause. Um, you know, they're, they're strongly motivated uh, to develop affordable housing, good, safe places for people to live. So mm -hmm. they, uh, they're, they're a wonderful group of people to work with. They're, they have a, a great, strong mission. So we, we've enjoyed that work. I imagine. And with the lifespan of projects potentially being so long, how do you manage that with your workflow? Where if you come across a project in 2018, like you mentioned, but now it's almost five years later and you're just going to bid, how does that affect all your other projects? Oh, it's a challenge. <laughs> it's uh, usually they all hit at once when you uh, least expect it. <laughs> I bet. So, and then it's impossible to predict. Um, the it's basically a never ending juggle. A lot of these projects that do live long lives will have a very intense period from, you know, eight to 12 or 24 weeks. And then it'll go into the state for funding. It'll sort of sit on the shelf for six or eight months. Um, and if in the case of a public project, if it doesn't get funded, then you may spend four or six weeks um, advancing the work, refining the cost estimate, uh, and then resubmitting again, in which case then your pencils are down for another six or eight months. Then you wait. And if you get funded, then then the uh, mission is to uh, pick it up and finish all the drawings as quickly as possible <laughs> and then get it out <laughs> finally and then begin a 12 to 24 month construction process. So uh, this past year, I think we had three of them that all uh, ran in parallel. Uh, oh, wow. An alternating cycle. So it was kind of the uh, perfect storm of the worst possible schedule. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I bet. And you can't just have triple the staff hanging around waiting for some of the projects to land all at once. So it basically means, and it's pretty traditional in our, in our trade where you, you, you hustle when you have to. And then uh, in the in-between so off cycle, you're doing smaller projects you know, with like a small medical office or small residential. Um, and that's where the little projects kind of fill in the blanks and kind of stretch things out and even out the year. But it is right. very difficult to plan and schedule because uh, one day you may have a project and the next day you don't have a project for another 12 months. So, right. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's just the unknown ultimately. Oh yeah. It, it's it, you're always kind of rolling with the, the flow. It's, uh, it's, it's very, you, you can plan as far as you can plan. And then after that, you just kind of just keep hustling. Right. And with those projects that end, that do end up happening all at once, do you ever hire people temporarily if you find that you are overloaded with work or do you kind of tend to stick to your core seven to nine staff member team? We've, we have brought in other uh, people depending on the task and the opportunity. Um, if we have a small project, if we're just absolutely swamped, we can, if we can hand an entire small project to a known entity, uh, we will. Or if we have small consulting or code type, you know, we may have small, in between those huge projects, uh, we may have a small uh, task that might be a, a code review of a building or a compliance 
issue or an inspection problem from a city that the client's been notified of. Um, and sometimes we can isolate those smaller tasks and hand them out to other architects or other uh, sole practitioners that we know and our friends and that we work with. Mm. Um, but for the most part, we um, we just we juggle and buckle down with our own team because a lot of times by the time you hand it out, explain to somebody what you need done, get it in and out, check it, go back and forth. You almost could have just kept up with the work yourself. So. Right. It's, a, it's always a it's always a juggle, but even currently, we're we're looking to hire. We're interviewing third party uh, drafters and um, uh, contractors, just so that we always have two or three options at our disposal. Mm, that's smart. Just so in case something does come up, you're prepared and ready to take it on. Yes, because it's uh, the workforce has been certainly been a challenge this last couple of years, especially post post COVID. Um, uh, it also been a challenge in Western Mass. Um, we may not have the same fun factor as some of the Boston metro areas. Uh, the youngsters coming out of college might be more excited to go, you know, shack up with a bunch of friends and have fun in the city. Um, you know, even though Western Mass living is nice, we have fresh air and <laughs> lots of great hills. <laughs> and trees. <laughs> but it's, uh, it is, the, the market is, has been a challenge for Everybody, I think across the state, architects and engineers have been struggling to uh, to find enough people to to augment their team. Right, right. And with all the different sectors that you focus on with residential, commercial, industrial, um, all of that, did you always work with in all of those sectors or did you kind of start with one and then expand from there? Or what was that process like? Well, I guess... Uh, the firm I started with for the first 18 years of my career, they were similarly diverse for the same reasons that you kind of need to be diverse out here. Uh, there's, I think in Western Mass, there's a couple firms that have um, limited their focus to municipal, like schools or senior centers or libraries. Um, but for the most part, most of the other firms are a little bit more diverse. Uh, so uh, I oh, early on and throughout our career, I've always had exposure to commercial and medical um, historic type projects, uh, just because out here in Western Mass, we're surrounded with lots of old buildings. Um, mm. uh, daycare, childcare, we were fortunate to have an early uh, introduction into those types of projects. And, and then over 20, 30 years, you kind of just get that accumulated knowledge uh, for each, each project type. So, I mean, if, if you come in most areas where you go looking for architect, you may not find too many that might specialize in, in a warehouse or industrial type space. Mm. There might be a firm down south in the Midwest, uh, but then those firms are not necessarily experienced in working in the area. Exactly. Yeah. And with all of the projects that you worked, worked on throughout your career, would you say that you have a few, like a handful or a few that are your favorites to date? Oh boy, um, I, it's probably always the the next one is the next best favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so as designers, we're always excited about the next new thing. Uh, but yeah, we've had, and it's funny with our industry. You know, we're designing and we have a product, but we're also uh, client and customer service oriented. So mm. underlying the delivery of and the construction of a building, we're really meeting the needs of a client and. Uh, and so we're kind of in that service sector. So there have been some very small uh, projects that you wouldn't even recognize where we did great work for the client. We helped them solve a problem, get something done on budget. Um, so those are the, the hidden things that you, you do. Um, but we certainly have been fortunate with a few nice little houses that we've worked on. Um, our work with... Um, let me see, uh, New Valley Bank in Springfield. We did their first branch bank. Uh, that was really fun. It was uh, uh, Rick Morris from my office kind of led the design on that. We took some terrible 1970s bank and made it new again and clean and current. Um, uh, one of our bigger clients, Home City uh, Housing, that does a lot of the affordable work. Uh, I think we transformed 75, two, three, four, six family homes from wow. old ramshackle houses into nice, clean, new places to live. Uh, we're the community builders. 
we helped them with phase two of um, 80, I think it was around 80 units of housing and a community center up in Holyoke. Um, and then little small partners, um, uh, hot, the hot table, uh, the sandwich shop out here is a, a, a local family created chain. Um, and we met them shortly after they'd done their first or second store, um, which the first two they did with no architect, <laughs> kind of seat of the pants grassroots. And then they realized, well, if they're gonna keep doing this, uh, the inspectors were calling them to get an architect. So then we met them and helped them produce, I think the next three. Um, and now they've gone on and uh, now they have a branded restaurant specialty architect alone, one of the few. Um, and so they moved on to a, a different firm, which is fine and, and wonderful. Um, but uh, that relationship and that work was was always nice. Uh, it was fun to transform. They were fun to work with. And, um, and they were much like us, small business, entrepreneurial, starting things from, you know, bootstrapping and <laughs> ground up, you know, literally out grabbing the groceries themselves. It, you know, they weren't even you know, fully blown up to the point where they had food service delivery and everything. So, mm. um, so there's, there's a lot over the years. So uh, we did a great daycare center for Valley Opportunity Council and Chicopee. Um, and that, so a lot of them are not just the, the building. It's really the kind of the quality of the experience of the service and how, how much it served or helped the client uh, in the process. So Right. And when your clients come to you, do they usually have a very specific idea in mind of what they need or do they come to you and almost need you to help um, lay it out what they might need and help to massage that idea or concept further? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I guess it comes, it's full spectrum, just like our clients. Mm. Uh, the professional developers, Jen, they this is their business, their stock and trade. So they know what they're looking for. They know what to expect out of architects. Uh, and they know how to build and develop. So they're usually pretty clear about what it is they're trying to do. Um, on the other side of the spectrum with all our smaller projects and local and homeowners, uh, sometimes they just come with a you know bunch of wrinkled up paper. Uh, you know we've seen ex we've seen people draw floor plans in Excel by just highlighting the edges of cells <laughs> to create a to create a plan, <laughs> amazing use of Excel, <laughs> not for its design <laughs> um, to, to scribbles, to, to notes, in which case sometimes you just have to interpret what it is they want. It's, yeah. It's, so a lot of what we need to do is be able to read the client, understand what they're trying to ask for, what they're trying to communicate. Sometimes it's written, sometimes it's drawn. Sometimes it's a you know a jumble of all of the above, so it's it's and it's pretty easy to tell once you've been doing this for twenty or thirty years. Um, uh, we can always tell when we have a, a homeowner or a smaller um, uh, commercial client, you know, even a doctor in a small doctor's office. They just know they need to have so many exam rooms and so much X Y Z, uh, so many receptionists, so many chairs in a waiting room, and then we just take that you know kind of put it in the soup, stir it around and come up with usually you know, one, two, three different uh, design schemes mm -hmm. to see what fits. And then we you know, evaluate that and massage and then advance. But uh, a lot of our people come to us without having any idea of either how to read a plan or how to even decide what to do. And that's where we get to kind of you know, juggle it all in, put all the ingredients into the pot and try to come out with a good looking plan. And I imagine that's probably one of the funnest parts about what you do is just having that creative freedom with each project and being able to take the information that you have and be able to create something based on what the client is looking for. Yeah, it's fun. And that same diversity too, because we're, you, there might be some firms in the state or in the country that, well, if you go to them, you're going to get modern architecture. If you go to them, you're going to get a traditional historic building. Our design response is really, uh, based on uh, a response that fits the need, you know, we're mm -hmm. we're doing a residential project. It's in the it's in the country, um, and that needs to be a good rural fit. Um, yeah. That design approach may not be 
you know, my favorite piece of modern architecture, but it's the best fit for the building and the project and the client. Somebody else might be in a modern building or an old mill. And the, the big thing is to recognize where you're working, what the context is, and design something that's a, a good, appropriate fit. Sometimes that fit is a, a modern contrast to an old building. We all mm. see that. And sometimes it is a historically correct replication of, of that building. So it's kind of, you know, knowing when to step on the gas and when to put a foot on the brake. Uh, right. And I like that approach because then you're not just kind of stuck in one lane. You're able to take all of these different aspects based on the part of the state that you're in and the project that you're looking for. I feel like it's kind of funny around here where I am. Um, my fiance and I bought new construction, but he knows our builder because he's a plumber and he always calls them like the Jamie houses because you can drive through our towns and see like the houses that just all look the same. And he yeah. calls them the cookie cutter colonials. And so it's just kind of funny where you can drive by and be like, oh, I bet so-and-so built that. And so it's nice yeah. that you have your own stamp and be able to do things that are different without being so recognizable. Right. And that's when people come to us because what we tend to do is, is a, a one-off, right? The, mm -hmm. the builders you're talking about, we have the same ones in town. You can go on the internet and buy a set of house plans and you pay a little extra and you have, now the, when you buy those, they're buying the license to either build it once or if you pay extra, you can build it endlessly. Mm -hmm. So if you buy a license to repeat it as many times as you want, they'll buy two or three house plans and they just pop them in wherever. Uh, that can be nice. And it can be dangerous because sometimes they're just putting up houses that don't really belong there. You know, yeah. The, the contextually, it may just not be the right fit. And, you know, you look at it like, who, how did that get there? Um, and then little things like on design, you know, what's the orientation, right? Your, your kitchen or living room is facing north. You never get any sun. It's always cold. Um, you know, when we design a house, you like that you know, maybe put the garage on the cold side, insulate or buffer the house. Maybe the, the bedroom or master or the great room have the view, not the view of the front lawn or your alley, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, what we do is design to fit the program and the site, uh, not just stick the plan that we bought off the internet onto a chunk of land and do it as many times as possible to make as much money as possible. But Right, right noble benefit to both I guess <laughs> yeah I bet and with the work that you do do you incorporate sustainability or like energy efficiency at all yeah that's been one of the nice um nice pieces of our, our work in our career uh in Massachusetts the Massachusetts generally is one of the most progressive states maybe right up there after California um, in terms of code and energy sustainable uh, design and design requirements in the code. Um, and then also the one of the lead funders, uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, DHCD, requires in their affordable housing for them to be sustainable, high performing, um, and you know, well built according to environmental standards, whether it's recycling, pre and post construction content of materials, um, just because the act of construction needs to be good for the environment, it needs to be uh, affordable to maintain. It's, uh, it does no good to build an affordable uh, house or apartment and then have to uh, you know pay exorbitant utility bills trying to heat it. So right. some of the trends that we're, we're seeing both, um, we're doing one project that's a Energy Star level two, it's very high performing very tight envelope it's all electrified no fossil fuels uh and this is all with an eye towards carbon reduction in the environment and dhcd has done similarly where they really um uh suggest and want to see their clients coming through with what's called a, a passive house uh it's passive house institute us uh, theus and that is a very high standard in terms of Heating, uh, mechanicals, electrical, building envelope, windows, everything is very high performing. Uh, you spend a little more on the construction, uh, everything from managing the vapor barrier, the air barrier, the weather, thermal transmission of blocking and nails through the building. Um, so that when you're done, these things just sip the energy. They just, you, 
it's 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 a great mission um and all the while looking at to do it with sustainable recyclable content low voc paints or no voc paints so mm -hmm. it's uh and that is working its way into everyday building massachusetts just passed the new energy code which is coming through now through july um continuing to increase the standards um and that's been a nice kind of cornerstone of, of everything we do. We try to work it into every possible project we can because failing to do so, all you're gonna do is increase your reliance on uh, utilities or fossil fuels. Right, and so like you said, spending a little bit more money up front will save you money in the long run. And then also, you know that you're doing what's right for the environment. Yep, it's uh, it's kind of a win-win for everybody. Uh, mm. Generally speaking, most of our clients are pretty well educated and uh, we're a pretty progressive state here. Um, there are some people that just want to do it the same old way, you know, house should breathe, aka leak energy and, and money <laughs> right out the windows. Um, but it's uh, generally speaking, we're, we're lucky to be here and there's, the technology is, is, is ever changing uh, and really advancing. So we've been, that's been one of the biggest career developments i think in the last even five years it's really really taken off so mm. kind of good for everybody absolutely and speaking of career developments what made you want to go into architecture in the beginning and just kind of having this as your career uh, um <laughs> i guess it's it, most architects tell you it's kind of a curse and a blessing right because <laughs> It's one of those things, once you want to do it, even if it, you can't sleep at night, you, uh, you, you kind, of, uh, kind of kind of sucked in to the light. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I think, it, you know, I think it came for me when I was a kid. Uh, we, you know, we hired some guy to draw blueprints to put an addition on our house for like a garage and a family room. And, you know, that kind of always stuck with me. I was interested in, it. in high school. Uh, you know, you take the tech drawing classes where they teach you to draw in my day with a T-square and a mechanical pencil and your gears and all that stuff. And um, then I, um, uh, I went to school for one year, basically kind of, a, well, I was in college, we'll call it a gap year, basically figure out what you want to do. Uh, decided that's really where I wanted to go. And then um, I applied to Roger Williams, uh, where Megan uh, Tick Media is, is currently teaching. Uh, a marketing class this semester. Uh, she also went there. Uh, and that, that was the beginning of the career. So, mm. uh, and that's college's minimum for architects. It's five years for a bachelor's of architecture, not, not a bachelor of science or arts. It's, it's a bachelor of art, or it's a four plus two, six years, um, undergrad and master's. Uh, and then once you're done, you're looking at a two and a half year internship. Uh, then there's NCARB uh, administers a series of, I think there's seven tests now. So once you accumulate so many hours worked under uh, supervision of a licensed architect, then you can, then you qualify to take the tests. So this is like three years after your five or six years, you wow. qualify to take your tests. And then once you pass all those, then you can, uh, then you're fortunate enough to pay them for your license. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when you worked for the other firm, what encouraged you to be able to start your own firm and kind of step away from where you were when you started your career? Well, probably like many things, I guess, um, I guess my career there hit a, a, a crossroads or at least the fork in the road. And mm. we'll say that I chose this one <laughs> and uh, ultimately chose to not uh, stay with that firm and uh, go off on my own. Um, so it was uh, just a little bit of one of those things that just kind of didn't work out as expected or as planned. And then mm. in the end has certainly worked out um, pretty well. So we're pretty happy with how things have gone. Absolutely. And for anyone listening to this episode who might be considering going into architecture and making that their career, what advice do you have for them? Um, well, let's see, your high school guidance counselor might tell you to take a lot of math classes. Um, I would suggest you take, um, if you're 
headed into the traditional creative design side of the field, I would strongly suggest you take the art, uh, art classes, the painting, sculpture, um, maybe the tech drawing, uh, because those are the those are the creative thinking side of the brain. Uh, you do need to be good at math, um, but uh, to be successful in the design side of the career, to be the creative side of the career, you really need to kind of exercise that side of your brain. Uh, most colleges require a portfolio uh, to apply for design school, so you're going to be needing to create and build up that kind of resume and that portfolio of, of design work anyway. Um, and I think that's that kind of critical thinking, that kind of problem solving, that kind of design problem solving, that's what will carry you, not just into college, but that's the core of what we do as in the career. Um, mm. Of course, there are some parts where people write specs, they run the, they want to be you know, I went to school with a, a young guy and he wanted to be the business manager. He liked the business of running a design firm. He wanted to know everything about how to be an architect, but he wasn't interested in being a, 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 you know, a stellar architect. He wanted to be the businessman. So he was getting two degrees, one in business and one in design. So like anything else within the field of architecture, there's lots of uh, subcategories, and little niches that you can uh, settle into. Right. And at the beginning of this episode, when we gave an overview of who you are, uh, we had mentioned that there are a few different organizations that you're a member of. And would you say that that's something that you recommend is getting involved in architectural organizations or professional networks such as that? Yeah, those those always help. Um, mm. The, For instance, uh, the, the AIA has regional chapters, Western, there's a Western Mass chapter of, of AIA, and uh, students can become associate or sometimes there's a student membership uh, version available to them. Uh, those, those memberships never hurt. Um, traditionally, uh, professionally, they support us, especially AIA because they have all the uh, support for contract documents, spec writing software, uh, lots of uh, professional development support, a lot of continuing education support. So those things are more specifically geared towards us. Um, it, it never hurts uh, to be involved with some of these or to be aware of them. Um, but I think the core of it comes down to, you know, the, the schooling and the close at home. And I know now a lot of the schools, if you're interested in it, you can go like up to UMass and do a, I think like a two week and a lot of other schools do it. You can, you can go for a two or four or six week summer session and have a, uh, have a trial practice. So if you're a junior in high school, you want to see what it's like to go to architecture school. It's uh, it's kind of like architecture camp. You can go up there, hang out with a bunch of like-minded people and design things and build models and hopefully have a little fun in the process. So there are yeah. a lot of opportunities that we, those kinds of things didn't exist when, when I went to school, but <laughs> <laughs> they are great for the kids now though, for sure. Yeah, they're nice to take advantage of. And I know, I believe that you're also uh, a board member for, for a few different organizations. Is that right? Uh, well, um, not serving any longer, but yeah, typically it's not unusual for either people like us, either both in, in business or in the design design field to, to serve either on board or local um, uh, committee or membership capacity. Uh, so as business owner, we participated in uh, with other local boards, and those are uh, good in terms of connections in business and connection with your peers locally. Um, and then regionally, uh, you know, like I was some historic district study committee in my town, and I chaired the town, um, and we've served supporting roles with other local boards. Um, those. Uh, are basically either opportunities to extend kind of as a as a public service, extend your knowledge base and your capability out to the public arena, uh, where in general, the towns have vault committees that are constituted volunteers, planning boards, zoning boards, uh, like the historic district committee or historic uh, society or historic committees. Um, and there's not that many people that are actually familiar with design or construction. Uh, so it's one of those things that comes with a, a calling is to uh, offer the service and support your town um, in those capacities. And 
and some of the towns have requirements where you need at least one person that's from the construction field, maybe one that might have legal experience. And, right. Uh, so some of the committees have a required diversification. So sometimes the committees will come looking for you. And if you live in a small town, they will quickly find out who you are and what you do and uh, try to get you uh, to come out and help them out. Yeah, I bet. And on the topic of local organizations, what would you say are your favorite local businesses to support? Um, let's see. So the, I guess there's a handful. <laughs> <laughs> so what I, the one thing is we're, we're, our life is built and centered here in Western Mass. Um, I will say we are, um, we are growing slowly and gradually out to extend some business out onto the Cape. We have a long time oh, wow. family presence out on the Cape. We, uh, my daughter lives in Harwich Port right now. Um, my in-laws are out there and that's a place that we spend a lot of time. Um, so I know on the Cape, there's a handful of uh, institutions or businesses that are, are definitely worthy of support. Capability mm -hmm. is one. They, uh, we've done a little support design work for them, but they, they provide opportunities and services for people with different needs. They run a farm, uh, employment opportunities, supportive housing. Uh, for people, um, you know, then there's some, uh, some great restaurants, everything from uh, Three Monkeys and Mad Minnow to, you know, favorite restaurants uh, all around us. Um, Western Mass, I kind of mentioned a, a couple of our uh, either clients or partners um, uh, that we've, or yeah, I guess clients that we work with, but we also have a handful of partners that are Critical to what we do, uh, landscape architects like Berkshire Design in Northampton, Bill Cannon in East Hampton, mechanical engineers uh, like Robert Hall over here in Agawam, a group called BLW out by Worcester, uh, Lang and Environmental uh, does site and civil work uh, uh, internationally. Uh, we've had the opportunity to work with them, so it's uh, so we're we're pretty fortunate to be able to kind of touch on both on a personal support level um, uh, as well as uh, to both bring on some of these businesses some women and minority owned and um, mm. bring them into the fold and then we're also fortunate uh, to be uh, consulting to or working for a pretty diverse client base so um, indirectly we're supporting them and, and they're helping us too. So it's a pretty symbiotic uh, relationship. Absolutely. I love that. <laughs> Kevin, this has been such an awesome episode and I've really enjoyed learning all that you've done in your career and the exciting projects that you've worked on. And I'd love if you could share with our audience where they can find you online in case they'd like to connect with you further. Oh, sure. Uh, you can find us at, I think, www.architectureel.com. Uh, so we are a Western Mass and Cape uh, uh, centric firm uh, specializing in uh, multifamily housing. But uh, as we said, we can handle almost any, uh, any of your design needs. Perfect. And I will link to that in the show notes. So that way our listeners can connect with you from there. But thank you so much for being a guest on today's show. Great. Well, thank you for having me.